If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory, Glory to the, the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was in the beginning, beginning is now and will be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thank you. 
the book of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, of Paddan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, so you think you could tell Heaven from hell Blue skies from pain Can you tell a green field From a cold steel rail A smile from a veil Do you think you could tell we run into when we look at passages from the gospel and or the Bible in general is that we know the story. 
So for example, when we preach on Good Friday, we know what happens two days later. And as a preacher, as a congregation, as a community, it is always a struggle, at least for me, to keep things confined to that particular day. And if we cannot do that, then the day or the passage or everything else included in that reading can lose its meaning because we can jump to the end of the story. Now I'm one of those, as I've mentioned before, that I read page, Wikipedia page on the movies before I watch so I can see what exactly is going to happen and or read the last chapter of the book before I start reading any novel. And that just to see what, how the actors and everyone else will contribute to the climax, to the end. And I can pick up the nuances and everything which the different characters are doing, either in the movie or in the book, as I progress along. But some of you will say that you're just silly because there's no suspense, there's no surprise. I already know what's going to happen, so what's the point of watching a movie? But movies aside, and bringing that same thing to the gospel or to the reading of this morning in particular, what we realize is that even though we know the end of the story, we can see the nuances, we can see how the story is developing. We can see how in this case, Jacob was the father of the nations. We can see why Esau, his brother, was bloodthirsty after him. And Jacob, because of fear of his brother, ran away. And Jacob ran away because he deceived Esau not once, but twice. First on the bowl of lentil soup, as we heard, or the stew, which he said, okay, sell me a birthright. And second, he conspired with his mother, so blind or almost blind Isaac can be confused or can be misled in blessing Jacob as his firstborn. And what we know is that uh, Isaac wanted his sons to come in so he can bless them. Esau is a hairy, hairy man, so the mother wraps some animal hide on, on Jacob's body so he can be, he, but when Isaac felt his body, it is here so he can think, which is Isaac, that it is Esau, and give him the blessing. But we also know in that story is that the because of this deception, or in spite of this, this, these deceptions, Jacob was destined to do certain things. And he did it in a very effective way. Twelve children, or twelve sons rather, who were the twelve tribes of Israel. They went into slavery into Egypt. Joseph basically continued to lead them on in Egypt. And after that, we know as Moses delivered. And thus the whole story begins, or the climax, if you look at that Israelites coming out of Egypt, it starts in this story, where Esau sold his birthright. Now if you leave the story aside, as we have recited or counted everything significant about the story, and just focus on birthright, that how people can sell their birthright for minuscule things, we can realize that it is a temptation which all of us have. And the temptation is to abdicate our responsibility. And the temptation is to let go of the authority or the responsibility we may or may not, we may have for certain lures of either wealth or power or just being saying that that is not for us. We are better off without it. We can leave it. We can move on to another things. And that's a temptation I think personally we feel all the time. We face all the time. There are certain who are thirst for and hunger for power, so they can lure us into that trap. They can bring us into that place and take what is important to us and to the world in which we live. You see, one of the remarkable things about the place, this church, St. Saviour's, is our mission to the street people. And it is a sad place. We see several people, and as I have mentioned before, more power to those who can go and operate in that very difficult situation, because my, my mental health, but more than that, just a response to it, does not allow me to be there because of the despair, because of sadness, 
because of what is going on in the lives of those men and women just leads me to a place to ask several questions. But regardless of my reaction to it, there are people in this congregation and other places who go to feed, who go to nurture, who go to talk, who at times go to listen to swear and abuses which are come towards them and just smile and move on. And that is an example of a place where church has not abdicated her responsibility, where the church has not sold her birthright to something else, to another power and say, it is too big for us, we cannot take care of it. And just to move it further, in these days, as there is that sense of uncertainty all around, that what we are realizing is that the church is being led in a very different way. What we are also realizing that it is an opportunity for us, the church, to make a significant difference in the lives of many people. And if you go back to the street mission, what we realize is that most of them, or almost all of them, are living on street. When the 10th city was in Winnipeg, three of them, most of the patrons who came that morning to have breakfast, walked from 10th city. I remember very distinctly asking this gentleman to observe six feet distance. And he looked at me and he said, that's a privilege which you have. I don't have that privilege. Just look around where I came from. Six feet social distancing, keeping yourself together, hand sanitizer, washing your hands is your privilege. I don't have that. So if it makes you feel good about yourself that you're keeping me six feet apart, I can move back just to because it doesn't make any difference because just look around. And looking around was again a situation where people, regardless of their circumstances or their own doings, which we most of the time want to look at, were forced to live in very difficult, even dangerous situations which can take their lives. So the church in that place has great responsibility. One is to feed. The other is to look beyond the band-aid solutions or the immediate needs which we can address. The city in which we live, all of us, where this church is situated, there are millions of dollars worth of properties downtown, which are owned by the churches, which are vacant six days out of seven. At this point, seven out of seven. Which have such a dwindling population that all the congregations, five or six of them can meet in one church. And we are realizing that what things were sacred to us, which are the buildings, because of this virus, because of this pandemic, we are realizing that we are still church, we are still community, regardless of us not being here present. So going back to those five or six buildings, that why aren't we thinking about developing or changing these buildings into a place of solace for those who struggle with mental health issues, for those who are struggling on the streets, for those who do not have a bed to sleep in, for those who are at a place, such a desolate place, and a place of despair that they say that social distancing is a privilege, which I don't have. In other words, what they're saying is, or what he said to me, that Edmund, you can protect yourself from the virus because you have resources. And I cannot, because I do not have resources. I am at a place where I just have to accept my fate, my condition, and realize that water, running water, warm water to wash my hands for 20 seconds with nice soapy stuff, or to have hand sanitizers, or to keep six feet apart from the person sitting next to me, is just not going to happen. And what are we can, what can we as a church as community do in that, des in that desolate and despairing situation. And you see, we can sell our birthright. 
very easily. And we can say it is the responsibility of the government, or it is the responsibility of the social agency, or it is the responsibility of someone else. And of course, Jesus could have said that when his disciples came and said, there are 5,000 people, what are we going to do with them? He could have easily said, what do you want me to do about it? Tell them to go home. I didn't call them, they are following me. I taught them. I've nourished them spiritually. What else do they expect from me? But that's not what happened. Or who could have done the same thing with a leper? Or same thing with a person who was hemorrhaging for 12 years? Or same thing with a widow who had lost her son? They go away. Just bury them. What do you want from me? I'm feeding you spiritually. And that's the, time, that's the message at times we give to the world. What do you want to do about us? We are feeding you spiritually. Rest of it should be to other agencies. We are setting up birthright for those agencies. So what we are thinking and listening is that we have to find a way where we can be feeding people spiritually but also addressing and utilizing our resources in the best possible way where someone doesn't have to stand up and say it is a privilege. Simple thing, hot running water with bit of soap is a privilege, which I don't have. Sanitizer is a privilege. And we can think, or I can think, that it should be the government providing them with all the portable water uh, sink they can have. Or we can think that we have buildings, we have resources, we have places which are empty six days. We have people around us who can minister, who can bring that dignity where a person is not saying with desolate spirit or deserted spirit that this is it, this is where I am. Think about it, pray about it. What does it mean to sell a birthright? For a bowl of lentil stew in that case? Or just to say we are here to spiritually nourish all of you. And to think about how Jesus found that balance between spiritual nourishment and addressing human condition. And to think about that when it comes to, to our interaction with people, as one of the Sufi saints said, that the buildings do not hold God. It is human heart where God resides. It's human life through which God lives. And that Sufi poet also said that it doesn't matter how rich or poor the human life is. God doesn't discriminate or distinguish between those who are wealthy and those who are poor. Jesus showed us very much what this Sufi poet encapsulated a thousand years later. And what he told us is that the buildings which we hold near to can really be a place where people are nourished, are taken care of, their issues are addressed, or at least hot water is provided to them so they can wash their hands and protect themselves from pandemics or other things which comes their way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
If you're following in the BAS, the prayers of the people may be found, litany number seven on page 116. Let us pray in faith to God our Father, to his Son Jesus Christ, and to the Holy Spirit, saying, Lord, hear and have mercy. For the Church of the Living God throughout the world, let us ask the riches of his grace. Lord, hear and have mercy. For all who proclaim the word of truth, let us ask the infinite wisdom of Christ. Lord, hear and have mercy. For all who have consecrated their lives to the kingdom of God, and for all struggling to follow the way of Christ, let us ask the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, hear and have mercy. For Elizabeth, our Queen, for Prime Minister Trudeau, and all who govern the nations, that they may strive for justice and peace, let us ask for the strength of God. Lord, hear and have mercy. And Heavenly Father, we just continue to pray at this time for those affected by COVID-19. And we do ask your indulgence in helping us to respect one another as we follow the rules that are set out uh, to keep the, not only the, the, the health scare away, but to further uh, the quickness of getting through it. For scholars and research workers that their studies may benefit humanity, let us ask the light of the Lord. Lord, hear and have mercy. For all who have passed from this life in faith and obedience, let us ask the peace of Christ. Lord, hear and have mercy. And we continue in prayer with the collect of the day. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. May we find peace in your service, and in the world to come, see you face to face, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.